Amata, Khosh, Omadid, welcome everybody to this new week, new Monday, that means new stream of Las Plumas de Simul. I hope you are all doing very well. And uh, yeah, as always, this is Plumas, your host for the rest of the evening. Today we shall venture ourselves into exotic <laughs> lands of mysterious <laughs> Persia. Wouldn't I be perfect for selling any kind of documentary on Safavid Iran? Salo, salo, bacha. Hello, I oh Ian, I so okay, okay. So good job, Ian. Good job, exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're big fans of Evangelion in this project, and yes, indeed, that you were listening to was the intro, cruel in thesis. If you ask me, one of the best pieces of music I've ever written in the entire history of the world. And that's just a hill. That's a hill I'm very comfortably willing to die on. Salam, salam. Khoshu Matid. Welcome everyone to the stream. How's everyone doing? How was your weekend? Did you have a nice weekend? Uh, Ian, I don't know if you had the chance to see the rest of my rant on the Chinese Dragons Ball. In case I hadn't said that enough, I repeated it yesterday in perfect Spanish. And oh boy, oh boy, I am. Um, so bad mannered in Spanish, although I think I managed to keep you really family friendly. Hello, Benidis, how are you? How was your weekend? Are you guys doing well? Just let me go on. I'm gonna do quick bips and bobs here. Gonna judge this men's all good. By the way, I'm not asking this anymore because I presume it is good, but I guess quality of audio and video are. Okay, right? If not, you would tell me, Blue Mars, I'm going to hear you. Oh, that would be a blessing. Don't you think? Um, yeah, Blue Mars, we cannot hear you. Blue Mars, we cannot see you. Oh my God, what is that over your head? You know, the, the usual drill. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we can hear Clemente. Splendido, splendente. Magnificent. We can hear and see you perfectly. That is fantastic. Before starting, thank you to everyone who's followed the channel. We're growing quite rapidly lately and that warms my heart. Thank you for putting your trust and your swimming desires on me. I hope I live up to the task. Thank you to everyone who subscribed as well. Uh, you helped me greatly develop my streams with your subscriptions and I honestly appreciate that a lot. Thank you, Bacham. Thank you just for joining the community. And thank you to my patrons. Shout out, a special shout out to my beloved Patreon family. My family over Patreon. Because yes, this project has a Patreon. Patreon slash Las Plumas de Simur. And um, yeah, these people are backing me up. They are, as I say, my patron family. And uh, yeah, I'm just very happy I have them in my life because I can achieve much more with their support behind me. So thank you, patrons, especially, especially those of Tier Murshid and those of Tier Ashdod. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me your support in the shape of money so I can buy, I can pay an artist to create these beautiful overlays. Hey! <laughs> so. How is everybody? I hope you had a very well rested weekend. My Monday was a, an odd one. I wasn't expecting, I had a clear idea of what this Monday was gonna be like and then everything went downhill. But I, I ate delicious lunch, so that always makes up for it. What are we drinking today? Because I've realized, and this is something Viridis pointed out to me. Thank you so much, Viridis. Oh my God, I cannot leave you without you. I don't know what I would do without you in my life. Thank you, Viridis. Um, I have not done the tea thing in quite a while, like today's tea. And today's tea is in this beautiful mug from Paper Chase. If you are from the UK, you know what Paper Chase is. It has basically, it looks like you. Yes, we look so similar, don't we? Have the same smile. I can see it. Um, I Basically, if you, if you live in the UK, you know what Paper Chase is. That's the reason I have no money in my bank. But don't worry, I don't spend patron money in I mean, if on Patreon does not come, <laughs> does not go to to um, Paper Chase, rest assured. And Paper Chase is just a brand of stationery things, and they sell mugs eventually. And I love skulls, as many of you know already, and as sure my students know by now. And um, yeah, what we're drinking today is just regular Turkish black tea because I am a classic. I, I'm a classical woman, and I love this one. Mmm. Hello Typhoon, I am going to take a moment to apologize to Typhoon because I cannot include those beautiful buildings we both know, they are in Esfahan, uh, this is just going to be a quick overview, so forgive me Typhoon if any of the buildings that you wish to see are not there. <laughs> 
please bear with. <laughs> so what are we going to talk about this afternoon is actually a summarized version of my lecture, the lecture I gave last week in uni. Because I asked you if you would be interested in seeing this uh, Safavid architecture uh, thing and you, you but chat was so keen, you really wanted me to show Safavid architecture and in fact Kiwi wanted me to talk about the Safavids <laughs> for quite a while. So yeah, I, I shall do my best, although we're not going to see everything, absolutely everything that I covered in my lecture because that was very exhausting and you know the pace in these streams is much more relaxed and much more chilled so we're gonna take a tour I've organized it in the shape of a tour and uh, yeah we just we're just gonna discover some of it as uh, fun <laughs> any stuff of it building is interesting yes and I have not included pictures of mine because yes I've been in Esfahan I'm gonna tell you a bit just just in, in a wee second but they're not gonna be pictures of mine in this in in today's session because um I know I just found professional pictures be taken and I thought they would be better than mine although I have to say Kiwi's phone was a fantastic camera so I said my pictures because I took him but it was not my phone it was Kiwi's phone so yeah thank you thank you for that Kiwi and uh, oh my god it's been so long since that <laughs> where does time go I actually have no idea so um I think that's everything from me actually let's just Pop by, yeah. Today, we're going to talk about the stuff a bit, uh, so the empire. And let me just see if everything's ready so we can start the ball rolling. Which apparently, it is. Mm, yeah, so yeah, I don't see any problems here. So, we're gonna start now that we have this beautiful overlay just uh, here. We can use it to project images, and now it does fantastic. I'm just really excited about what we want to talk about. I love Safari architecture so much. And let me tell you, I had the pleasure to witness the magic of Safari architecture firsthand. Because I had the chance, I had the chance, I, I was in Iran for uh, some months, um, not last year, last last year, on 2019. And I, uh, I could take a trip, uh, could do a trip to Isfahan and see all these buildings and uh, that really it's not just about the beauty of them you know this is not this this streams here are not just about beauty itself it's not just something gorgeous which it is but also they're impressive and they they have so much secrets to unravel and so many interesting things to um just to share so yeah today we're gonna take a quick trip to Esfahan and um uh you know I always emphasize the importance of the context you know, we need to know where and when in order to understand why. So if context is so important, let's just start from there. Today, we are introducing the Safavid dynasty, the Iranian Safavid dynasty, who ruled in Iran or Persia, like it was called back in the day, not something I'm keen of, but you know, we, we call it Persia too. Uh, they ruled in Iran between 1501 to 17. 22. And the founder of this dynasty is the Shah Ismail I. There's a brief restoration of the political power from 1729 to uh, 1736, but generally speaking, um, we consider 1722 to be the date where the empire is over. Like we, I, I do consider that, although I do not work with the Safavids to that extent. My research actually stops around 1600s and more accurately, thankfully, because it's just a million things to work with, I stop at 1550. I just, just bend that limit very much if my thesis needs to. But yeah, um, what we're seeing in the picture here in the map is a vast empire. The, Iran the Iranian dynasty of the Safavids created a huge empire and they occupied roughly, roughly what now is Iran. But if you look at the map closely, actually, you will see the borders do not match exactly, exactly with the modern country. These areas outside the Iranian plateau are what we call Irane Bozorg, which means in Persian, the big Iran or the greater Iran. These are regions of where Iranian and Persian culture had significant influence and also where uh, Persian language was used. And um, See, you can you can just see the Safavids. They didn't just limit themselves uh, themselves at what we now consider Iran. 
However, however, the origin of the Safavid dynasty, to know what the name, the, the name's important, the name of something is important, and where does this come from? So, once upon a time, there was an Islamic mystic called uh, Sheikh Safi ad-Din Ishaq from Ardabil. I'm going to show you where Ardabil is, because actually we need maps. I cannot emphasize enough the usage of maps in any kind of presentation. There, here we have, here, sorry my dyslexia, here we have a map of Safavid. Uh, what am I saying? Here we have Google Maps. <laughs> and that one pointed with an arrow, that one is Ardabil. All right, can you, can you just uh, see it? Can you see it actually? Can you see Ardabil? I think it, I mean, I can't see it, so I'm presuming you, you can't see it. So that is Ardabil. Then there lived this Sheikh, which by the way, Sheikh, sometimes it's a name, but in this case, it's not a name, it's a title. And Sheikh means a teacher, which means not any kind of teacher, a spiritual teacher. It means uh, it's um, someone to be, uh, how can I explain this? Right, a sheikh is someone that has been authorized to be the spiritual mentor for a group of people. And uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, and this is inside Sufism, which is the mystical branch of Islam. Would you be interested in a live stream about Sufism? Because I would. But you have the last word. I mean, in fact, patrons, are you there? You are the ones who have the last word. So yeah, we have this sheikh, Sheikh Safi ad-Din. He spent his life in Ardabil with his community the Safawiya mystical order. And then he died in 1345. Yes, I love Typhoon's enthusiasm. I was, I was missing her so much. I missed him. <laughs> Asto de l'antan, Michel, which is a very dramatic way of saying in Persian that I miss you. But yeah, now I, I'm teaching you Persian too. Not that I can speak fluently. Typhoon actually can speak better Persian than I do. Everyone can speak better Persian than I you. You, but chair that you are looking at me right now, you still don't know it, but you can speak Persian better than I do. So in 1345, Ishael Safiyad-Din passes away, but but then we go back to the, I'm, I'm gonna pull up the other map uh, again, so we can see. So we're back in the 16th century, actually by the end of the, uh, the 15th uh, century. Um, in the second half, uh, the Sufi order, the Safawiya, started a war against the Christian communities in the region of Ardabil and then started to grow stronger, exponentially, like notably stronger. And eventually they clashed with the ruling tribe at the time, which are the Qara Koyunlu. And uh, long story short, the conflict ended with the very young Ismail I, who was a member of the Safawiya order, conquering the Qara Koyunlu capital that was Tabriz. Um, this is when we consider the Safavid Empire to be established with Shah, you know, king in Persian, Shah Ismail as the first ruler. And something very important happened here is that is the Safavids made uh, Shia Islam the official religion. What does that mean? Why is it important? It is important. It's not that I Iran had not been... Um, this was not the first contact that uh, Shia Islam had with the Iranian areas, absolutely not. But this is the first time Shia Islam is established as the Islam to follow in this very vast empire um, before they had been Sunni. And very quickly, I'm just going to summarize what this Shia and Sunnah is very quickly. So, uh, the Islamic religion is divided in two branches. One is a Sunnah and one is a Shia. And in the 7th century, the two sides separated after a dispute over the legitimacy uh, of the Islamic ruler. And this is a very brief explanation for a far more complicated conflict, but bear with. The Shia uh, supported Ali, which is the cousin and son-in-law of Prophet Muhammad, and after him they came the Imams, which is the word to designate the spiritual and particular leader. And something very interesting here is that the Imam should be uh, connected by blood blood linked um, with, with Ali, and that's still believed. So here we have it, we have a branch established new dynasty that would embrace Sufism and Shiism as fundamental part of their, say it with me, self-defining narrative. Opposed to their Sufi neighbors, the Ottomans in Turkey and the Mughals in India, which are un, well, Sunni. So what, why are we talking about this? First, because it's very important that you know the context, the importance of the Safavid Empire relates so much in the vision they had of themselves, the way they saw themselves as different. And where do we place art in all of this? Art 
was a key element to represent the dynasty and, in particular, the ruling king. The Safavids connected themselves with the prophet, Prophet Muhammad, and remembered the bloodline was very important. So they created this narrative that they were connected to Prophet. I'm really sorry, Zerafe. They were connected to Prophet Muhammad. Uh, where was it? By via the 17th Imam. And that added a layer of authority, a layer of authority to the already existing monarchy, which was. Um, Good, sorry, I didn't want to intro. Good afternoon. Hello, Victor. It's good to see you here. Really happy to see that you tagged along. So, art was required to give this new dynasty a new image. It was a blank canvas where they could portray whatever they wanted. You see, authority in Islamic cultures is considered a combination of two things. Imperial slash political and theocratic power. That means the ruler is considered, and I'm quoting here, the shadow of God on earth. And the new Safavid Shahs needed to show this ultimate power granted on this early existence by transcending from higher realms. Art was used widely to display power. The Safavids are not an exception. This is not an exception in Iran. Every single ruling dynasty or monarchy or person in power has used art throughout up to a history of the world to represent themselves. Call it propaganda, call it, uh, you know, self-esteem, call it an actual interest in pursuing the arts. It doesn't matter. Art is fundamental. And I love our history. And this is one of the reasons I love my field so much, because we get to know the people of the past through the art they commissioned, they produced, they designed. What were the messages? What were the hidden messages? We shall see them today. And we're going to focus on architecture because uh, I love architecture, that, that's, just, that's it. I really, really like architecture. And uh, um, as I said, we are gonna go on a tour. We're gonna go on a tour and we are gonna visit, I'm excited, we are gonna visit the imperial capital, which is Esfahan. I need music here. I mean, there's, do you know the physician the novel from Noah Gordon that had an adaptation uh, that Ben Kingsley played even Sina. And um, so it has a musical. A musical was created, but it was in Spanish. A Spanish production, like a Spanish company produced a, music, a musical on the, on, the, on the physician. And actually the Esfahan song is pretty good, but I, I would love to play it. But some of you don't speak Spanish. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save that for Thursday. But yes, um, this is this is Esfahan. This is the beauty. Uh, beautiful square of Nashiahan, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So I've mentioned Tabriz before, and that was a city that was captured by Ismail I, and that city stayed as a capital for a while, but remember I mentioned the importance of the context, right? So during the whole Safavid Empire, a series of wars happened with their neighbors, the Ottomans, and they took place over and over and over and um, the Safavids tended to lose a lot <laughs> and I can say this because this is my Twitch channel but yeah they they lost quite a lot <laughs> so Tabriz all right so I, I, I need the map again I need I mean to show you a map I'm really sorry we need to know the context of this all right so Tabriz is a uh, can you see on the map uh, where's my map here's my map all right so Tabriz is very very close to the border to the western border of the empire so the Safavids then took the capital to Qazvin and finally in 1585 Shah Abbas I which is the, per the person the person that we will be discussing today he changed the capital to Esfahan who would turn into the splendid pearl on a velvet cushion of the Safavid empire you know there's a saying in Persian that says Esfahan Nase Jahan that means Esfahan is half of the world. Esfahan Nase Jahan. Esfahan is half of the world. Well, for some time sure it was. The new capital flourished as a center of artistic and architectural projects, but it was not constructed anew. This is something very important. Esfahan already existed in pre-Islamic times and in the 8th century, the Friday Mosque, the first Friday Mosque, was built. 
Friday mosques are very important because they are the center for communal prayer in the Muslim world and generally they become a significant landmark for the cities. Do I have a question myself? Do I have a picture? I do have a picture of the old, uh, yeah, it's not what you may ex be expecting, but yeah. This is a drawing. This is a drawing. Yeah, I know, I know. It's, it's, it's it's really pretty. Um, so uh, this is a, a drawing from a European traveler. I oh, I cannot remember it was the name of this person. I have it noted down here. Just give me a second. I have a note here, but I cannot find it. Oh, just you wait until I, I am reading here that we're gonna go for the river. We're gonna go for uh, the river. So, I'm really sorry. I can't. It, it it will come to my mind. Oh, where's? Oh, what's the name of this person? It's um. He's a French. He's fr definitely French. He's definitely French. Um, what is the name of this person? Kiwi, give me a hand here. Mm. It will come to my mind, I promise. Uh, we need more clues. <laughs> He's definitely French. <laughs> Is it Coté? Is it Jean Coté? Ah, we need more clues. I'm aware. I am trying my best. No, 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 no. It's not. It's Jean Chardin. The, yes. Yes. This is Jean Chardin. Yes, 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 yes. Exactly. That was it. Na Nashi? I don't know. I know two French people. It's not, it's not any of those two. So this is a drawing from, I think, is, is it really, uh, yeah, it's really early 18th century. So this is a drawing of the Friday Mosque, which was the old Friday Mosque. The first one that was built, as I say, the original foundation is from the 8th century. However, however, it was remodeled and structures were added through time quite a lot. But, but we can see, um, right, why are we... Why are we talking about this mosque if its foundation is before, way before the Safavids? Because, because, before Isfahan was made imperial capital, uh, oh, you mean, oh, all right, just hold on a second. I need to, I need to go to this. All right, I have it here now. Thank you so much, Ian. Mecca and Makoreba. Ian D. Morris, University of Amsterdam. That was fine. Oh, this is so cool. I'm getting distracted. I'm really sorry. Esfahan. Yes. Um, Esfahan. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Thank you so much. Oh, in case you guys want to read it too, like, but chat, there's like, just follow the link. Ian is very, like, very generous and he shared with all of us. So, why are we talking about this mosque? Wes, because, because Esfahan, the whole city was structured around this mosque because remember, this is the center for communal prayer. This is the gathering point. And if you can see in the picture, um, I don't have a map here, but this mosque is going to be widely imitated because the original structure consisted on a courtyard with structures on its four sides. And the most important side of these walls is the southern, in this case, which is the Qibla. And the Qibla is a wall that marks the direction of the Kaaba in Mecca, which is one of the holiest Muslim sanctuaries. And as I said before, in the case of this mosque in Esfahan, it will be pointed towards southwest, more or less. And those things that you can see there, those high vaulted halls, are called the Iwans. Those, the four Iwan structure was very popular in Iran, and this helps emphasizing the axis of the whole structure. The southern Iwan, which is the one you can see like the back, back in the picture, ooh, Chrono Magistrate, thank you so much for the fellow. The one that you can see in the back is the southern Iwan, and that, that is the one where the Qibla is. So it's marking those minarets, these paired minarets, are signaling where the most important part of the building is, the congregation hall and the Qibla. And this is similar to Christian churches, the most directs the eye toward the fundamental spaces, guiding the believer inside the place of encounter of the divinity. And this is, the, well, the courtyard we have there, we have a very important elements in the courtyard, for example, the ablution fountain, um, I don't know if you we're aware of this, but Muslims must cleanse themselves before praying. And as I mentioned before, this Friday mosque was the center of Esfahan. It was surrounded by the bazaar and very close where the ancient royal quarters were. But, but then, something happened. 
something very important happened and that is that Shah Abbas came along he came along and he said nah we're gonna change we are gonna change what are we gonna change absolutely everything he engaged in a major urban reformation of the city. We have a chronicle uh, of uh, Natan C uh, describing the process from 1590 to 1591, when everything began. And uh, Bachar, believe me when I told you, it was massive. Like new bazaar markets will be uh, constructed, um, old structures will be broken through. The whole axis of the city would change, would be moved towards the southern section, towards the southern section where the river Zion there was. A new palace complex was going to be built, a new square. If you look at the map, right, the map over there, look at the map and start from the top right. That top right thing over there, that's the, the Friday Mosque, the one there. You can follow the axis almost entirely, moving from the northeast to the southwest. And this, this, the reason this happened was because the two squares, the old the one, the new one, were going to be connected through the bazaar. On the one hand, we have the old Maidan, which, by the way, is a Persian word for square. You're going to hear me use that one a lot. And there, in the old Maidan, the mosque, uh, the Friday mosque was. And and uh, then afterwards, you have the beautiful... Oh, where's my... Uh, we need to see this again. This is what the old Maidan was. However, however, then we have the new one, the new square, the new, the new Maidan called Naqshe Jahan, which translates as something like the picture of the world. And this place was named like that because before there was a garden there, uh, Barre uh, Jahan, like the, the gardens of the world, but this was made um, a square. This is a modern picture and we would be looking at the square from the Qaziriya gate, which is the gate that gives access to the bazaar. Do I have another picture of the square? Yes, I do. In fact, in fact, in this picture, I'm going to show you right now, we can see all the elements we're going to be discussing today. And I don't know if all of them, I hope we have time for all of them. But yeah, this is another picture taken from the Qasiriya gate. So here, here we have Naqshe Johan. You see, oh my God, like, this was going to be the new city center. And the urban reformation of Shah Abbas wouldn't stop there new gardens, new palaces, new mosques were going to be built, new bridges that would connect with the southern Armenian neighborhood of Julfa. You see, this was a massive enterprise, a full reconstruction and reshaping of a city. Shah Abbas was privileged enough to have been politically and religiously established. It was not a convoluted reign. It, through the arts, he projected his image of spiritual and political authority. Every building represents an aspect of the ruler. Piety, military prowess, artistic refinement, whatever. Now we're gonna take the tour. Now we are gonna take our tour and we are gonna start with the square itself. We're gonna talk about Naqsha Yahan. Mm. But child, let me tell you something. When I was there, I was flabbergasted because it's huge. <laughs> It's really big. Um, oh my god, it is really... Oh my, my dear, it's really big. So, Naqsha Jahan was built between 1609 and 1610. It is over... Uh, what's the difference between an Iwan and a Pishtak? Mm, just let me... All right. So, a Pishtak... All right, all right. Uh, the thing is, the Pishtag is the frame. I didn't remember that. I had to look that one up. See, why is that? Because I'm not an encyclopedia. And uh, yeah, a Pishtag is the... All right. I Can I sh show you? We would see when we enter, we get closer to the um, to the mosque, uh, or any other mosque, actually. But the Pishtag is the frame. And the Iwan is the whole structure. It will be like saying, what's the difference between a door and a threshold? Like a door with a like an opening and wooden frame. Um, it is amazing. Also at night, sitting on a balcony overlooking uh, the Naqsa Jahan with tea and sweets. So good. I miss doing that. But there's a place I miss more. But sitting at night. Don't worry, we'll try to get there. I don't want to get a shit message. So, Paul RB99. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Hopefully. And um, so, yeah. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, the square. The square, the square, the square. This is over half a kilometer 
in length. And that at that time, we're talking about 1609, there was no such thing in Europe for the great urban projects in cities like Paris, Madrid, Rome. They had not taken place yet. The square, oh my God, this, there was nothing like that in the world, in Europe, they, nothing like that had been seen. And the square, if you actually look at the square, you can see the axis pretty important. It's similar to the most courier that we saw before with the cross axis. It is very well defined by four spaces. To the left, this is my left, okay, to the left, uh, there is the Sheikh Luftula Mosque. In front, just in a straight front, we have the Shah Mosque. And to the right, a very particular building we shall venture ourselves today in, which is the Ali Abu Pavilion or Palace, as it is known today. So, originally, oh, I just love it. You're going to love this picture. Originally, can you tell me, can you tell me what, which is the use of this square? Typhoon, don't say it. You know, I know you say, <laughs> I know you know, but... I want people to venture. What do you think the original purpose of this square and the old one was? Because both were intended for the same. As I say, originally. Give me your answers as I sip my tea. Hello, hello, Aaron. Praying or selling goods? Uh huh. That's a good answer, actually. Nope. Uh, I don't know if Kiwi is denying your answer, Aaron, or just saying no to the whole stream because it's Kiwi. It could be mess he could be messing with me. <laughs> so praying, no, exactly, because uh, spaces of prayer are really well defined in the Islamic modern world and also the medieval world. Um, not quite selling goods. We will get into that. But actually, actually, with the two squares were intended for originally was. Sports! <laughs> yes, sports! Originally, the, the, the Maidan was going to be used for playing Chogan. Back in the day, the game of Polo or Chogan in Persian and Turkish was super popular and the Shah wanted to build a space for him to either watch or take part in one of these polo games. Yes, Viridis, really. In fact, the polo girls are still there. Do I have a picture of the polo girls? Oh, I, I think I do. Oh, yes, I do. Yes, 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 yes. Do you see in the shorter sides, you know, where the mosque is and where the, uh, where the entrance of the bazaar is, you can see still the girl. You can still see the girls. It, it's just, it's just amazing. And remember when I said like Europe and Iran in this moment, you remember I, I talked about the context. So Europe and Iran were more connected than uh, we could firstly consider at this time. European travelers went so often to Esfahan and were marveled at the sight of this square. And you can see the goals in this drawing by Jan Chardin. Yes, I remembered his name. Thank you. Uh, you can see um, the, the drawing from Jean Chardin from 1705. And these travelers, they are such a source of information. From these travelers and the journals, we obtain great info about how the city worked at that time. And also, we have another one. Pluma, so we have another one. Yes, we do. Oh, yes, we do. Look at this print. Look at this print by the Dutch. And I'm really sorry for this. Uh, Cornelis de Bruin. I don't know speak Dutch. Typhoon, did I pronounce that correctly? Like Cornelis de Bruin. This is a little bit later. It's like 18, uh, 1810 something. So this shows the square, how the square did not only fulfill its original purpose, but also was used for other things, like Adam was saying, trade and commercial activities became a key activity in the Maidan. And those arcades surrounding the spaces were occupied with shops and coffee houses and traders would gather there to do businesses. And it's really interesting because all the time this once royal square, because remember this was intended for the Shah to watch games or play games, it became also a public space combining, combining every single aspect and of course of course the religious aspect was there but i'm sure they were selling medieval popcorn to watch the polo i'm still winning <laughs> for sure they stole some snack i bet they i bet they they sold pistachios or dates or oh, horma mm. i love horma 
and uh, maybe some nuts and of course tea at least in the modern times i don't actually know they sold tea you know in iran at this point coffee was far po more popular than tea which is something i don't understand myself but hey huh. oh for god's sake the safavid era era art is not only in isfahan of course not of course it's not but this is this actually this i'm really sorry i uh, didn't get to cover all the beautiful safavid cities but this a uh, Twitch stream comes from a lecture I gave in university focused on Esfahan. I asked on my Twitter if people wanted to watch it and they said yes. So that's the reason we are covering Esfahan today. Maybe in the future I will talk about all the cities, but I want to ask you a uh, sandwich. Which is the one? Which is the city you would have picked? Which is it you would like to see in a live stream? Because, you know, we have a saying in my family, we have a rule here in this house, in my family, which is something that when you don't like something, you are perfectly entitled to say, but you need to offer an alternative. So I'm hearing, I, I, I cannot hear you, you, read you. Depends on the era. We're talking about the Safavids. You choose. I'm giving you entire freedom to choose. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk. We're going to go to our first beautiful building here. And uh, I mentioned the religion aspect of this square. And we're going to talk about the Mosque of the Shah, which is beautiful, but it's also very interesting for many reasons. Um, remember that I told you that every single building in Esfahan represents an aspect of the ruler and religion is a very big part. Remember, again, authority comes from the political power you have, but also from above. You need to, you need to show that one off. So, um, the Shah Mosque which is also called the Imam Mosque, it was funded in 1611 and we we can see uh, similarities with all the mosques at the time. We don't have time to, to see them, but here you can see the minarets on the A1 in the entrance and also the minarets on the main prayer hall, which is covered with a dome. So you see, as I was mentioning before, everything is emphasized visually. They're marking these minarets the, and the biggest A1 are marking the entrance first and then the entrance where the access is to the prayer hall, which is the most important part, and that dome is also emphasizing that. And when you enter, they're directing you towards the Qibla, which is the part you should be praying towards. And um, we're going to see the entrance because it's possibly one of the most impressive examples. There's nothing of, look at this. I, I wish I could say, I wish I could say this is my picture, it's not. <laughs> This is a picture by Mustafa Miraji, which knows his way with the camera but far better than I do. And I'm really grateful we have people like that in alive. It is really impressive. It is very beautiful. The, the blue color is so unique in this type. In Esfahan, uh, in Safavid Esfahan, the blue color we have here is like its own point. I really like the, these games. So in this entrance, um, all right. So. In religious spaces, uh, figurative art is avoided. So here, art uh, takes another, explores other possibilities. And the most important ones are calligraphy, um, vegetal patterns, and also uh, geometry. Geometry, and we have these arabesques, which are these vine scrolls that could be, they, they could be enlarged or shrunk at infinitum, you know, covering entire walls. And you can see this main iwan, which is marking the entrance. If you see actually the minarets, they are covered in calligraphy with the name of God in Kufi calligraphy, but but surrounding the pishtak, which is the frame, aha, uh -huh, we have a very big calligraphy inscription and a lot of information is gathered there. We have the date of completion, we have the name of the ruler, praises to Ali and Muhammad, and this one, this one is uh, in Nashr, uh, which is a type of tracing, like with a pen, like much more fluid feeling. Now the Kufi is more stiff, like, uh -huh. And also, by the way, the minarets are 42 meters and they are topped with these wooden ornated balconies. They're very, they're very tall. All right, thank you. <laughs> But the, the part that most catches the eye, in my opinion, to everyone who goes there are the Mukarnas, which are amazing to dive in and wonderful to contemplate. And in fact, in fact, they have a very powerful spiritual message. So this sort of stalactite forms create three dimensional cells that in this case are made of ceramic tiles. I haven't mentioned this, but the whole building is decorated in ceramic tiles. Tiles. And the colors here are following the haft rangi or the seven colors 
technique, which has a very important spiritual meaning, spiritual meaning, what happened there? Um, spiritual meaning. <laughs> With uh, connected to the seven layers of the heavens and the seven reigns of the supernatural, the seven spheres in the cosmic universe. You see, nothing here is casual. Absolutely nothing. And um, yeah, it's the the. Oh, it's really. I we, I hope I could expand a little bit more on this. There's something. <laughs> there is something called in these kind of architecture. There's something called spiritual mathematics. I'm not making this one up. It is a thing. I work with it. It's really complicated, but it's fascinating. But and another thing we're familiar with, um, these are the, these arabesques. I do. I have a picture of the arabesques, so we can we can see them a little bit better. Do I? I don't. Um, the sheer density ornament. It is crazy. This one. I mean, this this this, this horror bakui exists in Sefabit. <laughs> Like 100, 200 percent, almost for sure. There, there's not a corner in the entire mosque that has been left, you know, uncovered. It's, it's just not there. It's just not there. But I want to show you. I actually wanted to show you something very interesting, which is the structure of this mosque. So you see, there on the corner, in the top uh, right corner, we have the square. But because of the direction of Mecca. The whole direction of the building had to be altered. Um, and you can see there that uh, this mosque uh, follows the 41 structure. And we have the main hall with the Qibla, with the bigger dome, we saw before. So it, the mosque does not follow the axis of the square. It's curved on one side. And this is because the Qibla had to be pointing towards Mecca. So they have to modify the entire structure. But they wanted to keep the main entrance oriented towards the Maidan. So this is what they did. <laughs> when you enter, when you access the building, you actually need to take a, t like a turn. And you need to take a turn to, to access it. And it's wonderful, really. Mm. I'm going to see very briefly another mosque, because yes, there's more than one mosque in this square. And this one is Sheikh Luftullah. Remember, Sheikh is a title, a spiritual title. It's the name of a spiritual mentor. Yeah, an, an authorized spiritual mention. Hi, I come on to say hello. I'll be complicated Monday. I will get to know about the stuff a bit on the Spanish stream. Thank you, Nazo Ross. Thank you for popping by and thank you for saying hello, as always. So, um, the reason this mosque... Do you spot something in this mosque? Something that's not, something's not there. Can you see it? Uh, by the way, uh, sandwich, I'm really, I really would like to know which one is the, uh, the city you'd like to, to hear about. I'm super interested. Yes, what is it? What is missing? Something's off. What is missing? I didn't realize at first. I mean, I had to study this to, to actually to know <laughs> the minarets i don't know english word exactly yes the minarets are not there and this is because this mosque was not intended for communal prayer you see the minaret is where the al muedin climbs to call for prayer to the communal prayer however this was a private mosque for the members of the royal family so they did not need um these minarets you actually access like underneath by a tunnel connected with ali Kabu. it's super interesting it looks like a like an adventure set scene it's really interesting so same same at the Shah mosque you can see the combination of under glaze tiles the calligraphic inscription the mukarnas but but what i wanted you butcher to see is the interior because it's very oh, this is one of my favorite places i i didn't expect to like this one so much uh, one of my favorite pictures from our trip to Isfahan is here i had not shown it because it contains personal it's it's, it's uh, a picture of my people of my friends so i'm not gonna put that one up but but look at this look at this you can see absolutely everything we talked about. You can see the pointed arches, very, very common for uh, Safavid architecture. We can see the Mukarnas, um, sorry, uh, Mukarnas are outside. Uh, we can see the arabesques here covering the wall, the frames with the calligraphic inscriptions, and this one, this niche that you have in front, actually it has Mukarnas in it. This is the Mihrab. The Mihrab is this niche, a door-like uh, opening that marks the point towards you have to it is in the qibla wall and you have to pray towards that direction and everything climbs up in in this you can feel this um this ascension uh sentiment and then you finish with the dome 
which is impressive and possibly my favorite dome in the world from the inside. It's um, it's surrounded by these arches, the calligraphic inscriptions continue, they praise Muhammad, they praise Ali, and they praise the ruler as well. So the combination between golden slash ochre color with blue here is very on point. We can see the arabesques are these like uh, vegetal motifs covering entire spaces because something very good arabesques had is that they could be, they could be continuing, continued ad infinitum they adapt to the surface they have to cover that is actually amazing um but we're gonna see another building now um where's my picture where is my picture oh yeah we're gonna see a building i was very interesting and very curious to know about and this is ali kapu pavilion <laughs> entrance gate isn't there supposed to be a peacock in the center of the dome you see i've like no, not exactly, because it's a mosque. Because, I mean, you know, figurative art does not happen in, in mosque. I haven't seen them. I think it's more that the, the medallions, those rosettes, these palmettes, imitate a peak of feather. That would, I would sign up for that. But I was there, I've seen a million pictures, I do not see the peacock anywhere. But possibly it's there, it's just that I have seen it. Um, I don't know, but we're going to talk about, about Ali Kapu, I said, the, the high entrance, as its name uh, means. Uh, yep, the high gate. Its original purpose, in fact, was to give access to the palatial complex on the other side. But over more of 60 years of additions, it became a palace and quite a monumental one, if I am allowed to say that. The top platform we said there, the balcony, is called Talar. And there, the Safavid Emperor had a good view over the Maidan and, for example, to watch polo games or to address the peoples. Um, the Shah also received ambassadors there. Uh, the Spanish ambassador, Don García, Don Gar Gar García Figuera, <laughs> was received in the roof of Ali Kapu in 1619. Uh, yeah, exactly. I said that Kiwi, they would watch polo games from there. But we are going to see. Oh, I think I have a picture of uh, the structure. I have a plan. Yes, look at it. This is the aspect of Ali Kabu. But the one we're going to talk about now is the top one, is the top, the top room, which is the music hall. And I'm not going to hide it from you. This is my favorite place in the world. Architectonically speaking, this is my favorite room. And I shall explain to you why in a minute. The room uh, was intended for banquets and feasts that would be accompanied by dancing and music. The four walls and the upper part are built with a system of doubled plaster walls with the apertures in the shape of bottles and musical instruments. And this is not just a few aesthetics choice. I'm going to show you the picture, like the, the picture. Oh, goodness gracious, I love these pictures. This is the roof. This is the, the ceiling uh, of it. And um, all right, here's the deal. The walls absorbed the echo. Chini <laughs> honey. The walls absorb the echo and create one of the first quadraphonic sound systems that we have prior to the invention of electricity. Thus, the sound expands and reaches the ears from each corner of the room at the same time. Uh, I guess they're made of wood. No, it's plaster. It is plaster. <laughs> if you place yourself in the center of the room and you clap, you would be flabbergasted at the absence of echo. There's no echo here. This way, music could be enjoyed without distortion or inconvenience because the decorative mukarnas and the vase-shaped holes also reduced reverberation and acted like a sound diffuser. Again, this is 1660 this room was finished. It was gonna be a while until we had electricity and this just blows my mind. It's just when I was there, we had to, all right, I'm going to take a little digression here. Singing is not permitted in Iran right now. Singing in public, I mean, at least not for women. When we were there, someone was singing, a woman was. Listening to that person singing there is an experience that I'm going to carry with me forever. Because 
the acoustics there, even if it was full of people, because it's a very touristic place, the acoustics, the feeling of hearing that voice, they were carrying out some kind of study or something, I cannot remember. It was something else. It was definitely something else. I, I wish I could take all of you with me on a trip to the past and we all could listen to that. It's just only women or is it forbidden for everyone? As far as I know, on the street, uh, for women only. I know, <laughs> we're not going to discuss that, but it's important that you know. And finally, finally, I wanted you to talk about one of the places. Do you remember when Typhoon mentioned that looking at the square from the tea house at night in Nakshi Jahan was magical? Well, I have another place I would love to take you which are at night to enjoy tea with, and that is Si Yose Bol, which is a bridge. And uh, I'm going to talk about the bridge and we shall talk about those things later. So this and this is the last structure we are going to be focusing on today. And I wanted to bring it because it's not a palace. It's not a mosque. It is the a bridge and a very important one. The, I mentioned before that the urbanistic renovation of Esfahan implied expanding the city towards the river Sayande, which is the one that you see in the picture and even beyond uh, where the Armenian neighborhood of Jolfa is. This is a public work. And Siose means 33, and Pol means bridge. So it's saying Siose Pol bridge is actually not correct. Um, but it received its popular name from the 33 spans that sustain its entire structure. It was started in 1599, it was finished in 1602. And this is the largest, the largest and longest bridge in Esfahan. And it has another name, in fact, it, the real name, which is Alagverdi Khan bridge. <laughs> this person, the al Verdi Khan, was the commander-in-chief of the armies, a man of Armenian origin and apparently very close to Shah Abbas I. But today everybody knows the bridge as Siosepol. Um, back in the day, the interior was decorated with paintings, colorful images, possibly very similar to those that we can see in uh, the Palace of Chel Sotun, which I would love if you guys to see, but maybe for all the chance, look at this beauty. Oh, ah. Mm -hmm. So the bridge consisted of these arcade galleries for pedestrians um, enjoying the river's view and in addition it provided passage for the transportation of animals and goods and it was simultaneously a thoroughfare and a public space. Both aspects were crucial for the prosperity of the capital and the bridge served as a symbol of al Verdi Khan's devotion for his ruler, but also highlighted Shah Abbas's urban policies of resettlement and development. And, and there, this is the place where people gather at night. They, there's, there's so much life in Siosepol. By night, you can hear people playing music. You can see people selling tea, making food and selling food. People just strolling up and down the bridge. It is a place that is beautiful to, compl to, to contemplate Sorry, at daylight, uh, under the daylight. But at nighttime, it changes entirely. It's a completely different space. And it was a, one of my favorites when I was in Esfahan. Uh, Chet Sotun is also very badly preserved, so not the best place to show off right now. It is poorly preserved, Chet Sotun. Yeah, that is that is in fact true. But yeah, this is um, yeah, this is uh, Siosepol, and I really liked it. And apparently, all those arcades were painted back in the day, but either they were covered or the humidity, because you would agree with me that a river is not exactly the best place um, to put any painting because it deteriorates so much. But this is this is what I wanted to show you, Butcher. This is the extent the urban reformation of. A bus took like and, and reached. It is amazing. We are talking. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna show you the map again because we're talking about someone what that entirely, entirely reshaped the city. A city that existed already. This city existed and it was fine. It was you know had a destructor, the old Maidan, and people just go along with it. Well, but then, but then, Shah Ismail came. This is the map of the Reformation. Shah Ismail came, uh, sorry, Shah Abbas came and said, no, we're going to create this magnificent modern city serving purposes of propaganda, purposes of economical expansion, purposes of religious expansion, because the, the dynasty needed a new image. And this is the importance and the power of art itself. I cannot start to describe how fundamental art was for the self-defining narrative of the Safavids. 
it was just the way they had to present them themselves towards the world and um, yeah um, do you wish to see any other pictures any of the pictures again I would love to I'm just gonna play a random one I'm gonna put up which one all right let's just see the mucarnas no not the mucarnas um well i can well, i can put the mucarnas as i look for the other one esfahan is magical although it's not my favorite city in iran my favorite city in iran is yazda but esfahan is something else and i i think it would be a mistake no this if you're intending to go to esfahan do do because it's, it's very it's very unique uh, the past is very present there the it intertwines so much with the present life. People are very used to tourists and yeah, they, they try to communicate in very uh, funny ways. Uh, look, the blue color under the day, the, the, the sky is clear. It is something else. It is something else. And uh, yeah, I think, do you have any questions, Bacha? Do you have uh, anything I, I would like, uh, you would like me to answer for you or I will explain myself a bit? I really hope you have enjoyed the tour. Um, Esfahan was beautiful to um, it was beautiful to discover it was beautiful to visit but yeah I I don't know if you would like to ask something if not I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the picture I'm gonna leave the picture don't worry but I'm gonna put up the music hall again <laughs> There we have it. Oh, this place is magical, Bacha. This place is magical. I was asked in, uh, I think, a past uh, Plumas Royalty, which was my favorite um, architectural area. And um, could you explain something about the acoustic of the dome of the Shah Mosque? Unfortunately, I think I, uh, on the spot, I am afraid I cannot. But Acoustics in general were very important for the Safavids and indeed I had the pleasure to attend a lecture and uh, Typhoon was with me indeed. Uh, it was a lecture on uh, let me have it, on the acoustics of the entire square, of the acoustics of, of Naqsha Jahan because this place would be, used, would be also used for parades and for public displays of power. Like the the whole like the the whole square is a display of power. It can be artistic power. It can be religious power. It can be political power. The three of them at the same time. But acoustics play a very important part. In fact, if we think about the dome of Naqsh Jahan, which is the one that we can see at the back, that dome is made for a prayer hall. So that means the acoustics were paid so much so careful attention. Uh, that okay, Kiwi. I see your question. I I am uh, I'm on it. Uh, but yeah, the acoustics of the dome are carefully studied, like every single other one in Esfahan mosques, because the intention is for the person who's directing the prayer to be listened from absolutely everywhere. So the acoustics of a dome work in a way that if you throw the sound upwards, it reaches you know, the the dome captures the sound, it goes up, and it returns back again. I'm, Excuse me for my lack of technical um, vocabulary. If you're a sound tech, I would love you to intervene and help me here. But yeah, you need to think of it as a place. When I was there, it was empty. It was empty. It was a lot of echo. But I would, um, I would presume that um, uh, I would presume that the the um, yeah the whole filled with people and actually with people performing a real prayer that would diminish the echo quite consistently as i'm saying this place is huge and we were what four people at the moment i was there with a lot of echo and um yeah i'm really sorry i cannot give you a more detailed answer uh paul uh but yeah i i would love you, the poll on your name to be after bridge in persian i would be just happy and Kiwi wants to know what about the importance of Armenian culture and art for Abbas. <laughs> it was not Armenian culture, it was Armenian money. Because Armenian merchants were very, very wealthy at this time. So much that they paid for half of this reformation. Shah Abbas invited the Armenians to Esfahan to move to Esfahan, gave them their own quarter, which was already existing there, but it became even bigger. And because of the Armenian money, the art market moved so much. And also, those were... Uh, Armenians that had fled um, 
the 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 place of origin because of the wars with the Turks with the Ottomans. So these wealthy merchants came to Esfahan, provided quite consistent movement to the art market and to the um, to, to the market itself, not only the art one, but they were very important. They were very important, as I said mentioned before. Al Ahverdi Khan was of Armenian origin himself. So yeah, they played a significant part in the social. And political and artistic life of of uh, of Isfahan, at least when Shah Abbas was there, he was. I mean, the acceptance of those people was as such that they have their own cathedral in Vanka Cathedral. I don't know if you have been there, but uh, there is a cathedral there in in Isfahan, and it's fully covered in paintings from the inside, and it's it's something it's something to see. It's quite a shocking view, but it's there. And it's it's really interesting. I like the cathedral from the exterior a little bit better, but that's only my personal taste. Any more questions? Any more questions? Uh, which other picture would you like to see? What can we go now again? Mm. Oh yeah, the dome. We're gonna see the dome again. I'm gonna try and look for the peacock. Because I'm like... I'm obsessed now. I, I, I really want to know about that peacock. I could ask one, but it might not be interesting to everyone else. Just go for it, Kiwi. I mean, if... No one else is speaking. You can take the floor. Ah, oh, um, Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? No, we have it. I'm gonna look for the peacock. In fact, I'm gonna just open it and hyper zoom it on my secondary monitor. Oh, I'm, I, I cannot see the peacock. I mean, I can't. <laughs> Absolutely not. All right, time for I think there's no peacock. Do you know how the Safavid dynasty coped with the uh, Turkmen and Mongol legacy of previous governments? I actually don't know. And that is a question that could be answered perfectly in either a very long paper or a thesis. Um, they downplayed it, embraced it. I don't think they embraced the Mongol heritage. I don't even know if they acknowledge the Mongol heritage as such. I really don't think so, because between the Safavids and the Mongols, there are 300 years of history, and the Ilkhanids, they are amazing, and uh, I love them, because you know the Ilkhanid is, uh, the Ilkhanid dynasty is my favourite in, in Iran, but they only reigned for less than 100 years, and although they did amazing, uh, they contributed greatly to the, oh my goodness, I just realised that now, given how the, the picture is placed this is so beautiful can you see that it looks like the teapot like the spout of the teapot is releasing this kind of vegetal pattern like this uh, this um uh cello sea looks like it's coming out of the tea spout the teapot spout i am in love with that one <laughs> sorry kiwi <laughs> I just really like, n n n no, not the steam, like the window. It looks like the window is coming out, like the, in this shape. I don't know. I just really like my overlay. Thank you, Chi, so much. And um, but I, I just really don't know. I don't think they embrace it. But that the Ilkhanids, despite the what I think is great contribution to Iran's self-defining narrative, um, despite that, I do not think they embraced um, the Mongol heritage because they were. There was a very big intention from the Safavids to create a different language, a different visual language for the new dynasty that was very powerfully based in uh, their enemisty <laughs> and the, the war with the Turks and the religion and um, the political views and the heritage from Sufism. Because as uh, I mentioned before, especially at this point where Shah Abbas uh, was, uh, um, was ruling, the, you need to remember the origins of the Safavid dynasty as, um, um, as a Sufi um, uh, congregation, Safawiya. So that is the um, that is the reason. Uh, I think they. I, I don't know if they downplayed it, but maybe they ignored it or didn't pay attention to it. I. It's a complicated. It's a very interesting question, Kiwi, but a complicated one, and definitely not that not one that I can answer here. I'm just giving my own thoughts. Okay, I'm just giving my my own personal thoughts on the subject. Hello, El Noob. I'm quite fine, thank you. But remember, the stream is in Spanish on Thursdays. But thank you for asking. You're very sweet. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Any other requests or pictures? That's fine. If we have time, uh, here's another one. Sure. I hope it's a little bit shorter though. 
not sure to because I don't know how much time you have left, Bacha, but I don't know if I can bore you with these things. Anyway, I hope you have enjoyed the tour with the alphabets. Um, I apologize, I'm new to the English class, but what day is it today? You mean on the week? Today's Monday, if that's your question. <laughs> I'm still, I mean, if you see me looking sideways because I'm still trying to look for the peacock. A typhoon, I don't think there's a peacock there. <laughs> well, why do you think Sunni Muslims were prosecuted by Abbas while Armenian Christians went? I think it was a way of emphasizing the new authority. And the new authority was Shia. The Christians, well, first of all, the Armenians had the money and money, money, money. Must be funny in a rich man's world. You know, the Armenians paid for this reformation. Like, a solid amount of this reformation was paid with Armenian money, so they could not just kick them out. And um, I think there was an ulterior motive that was that one. And also, uh, Christians, that's why it makes sense, yeah. Christians were not exactly a problem quote-unquote, Norwich is a problem, but for the Safavids, they do not represent anything. The Sunnis, though, Sunnis were the Mughals and Sunnis were the Ottomans, so they had to emphasize the new authority that was Shia, and that is one of the reasons that, sadly, the Sunni Muslims were prosecuted during uh, Shah Abbas's uh, reign. But, again, that's just a very quick answer to... based on the things I know, basically. I, I, I think that would make sense for me, like... Sadly, well, the, the more elaborated question, answer, sorry, would be that they wanted to emphasize a new authority rule that was based on Shia Islam, and also the Armenians had the money. <laughs> and they were helping quite a lot in developing this new capital, the imperial capital. The, the, I would really love to be, I, I would love to express myself better and to emphasize, you know, the, the importance of the Armenians in this whole crazy reformation that Shah Abbas uh, engaged but yeah I mean maybe we can talk about the Armenians in another stream I don't know um but yeah so but yeah if no one else has more questions I think that's uh that's us for the Monday I really hope you enjoy the tour I really hope you liked Safavid Esfahan I'm aware that there's more than one just uh, city of Esfahan um and uh, I would have loved to talk about more um but yeah, uh, let me know what you thought. I really, I really hope you like the pictures. I really hope you like the explanation. And uh, it doesn't matter. It's um, uh, they happen all the time. Uh, you can check the the stream uh, schedule later on. It's down there. Like uh, t -t 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 you follow the link. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, thanks to you, Colonel Colonel Magistrate. Sorry, that's a very. Um, I think I, I'm I'm talking with an authority here. I don't know who that person is, but it's an authority because it's a magistrate of Chrono, which is time. <laughs> Can you say why I did? I know Greek. And uh, it was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. I'm really happy you enjoyed it. I wish I could take that tour live. I wish I could just teleport ourselves all to Esfahan so we could enjoy it live. Um, I'm really happy you liked it. And this was because you asked for it. I asked on my Twitter, you responded, and I delivered. So, yeah. Thank you. I actually liked it a lot. Maybe... You could see I had another, the other lecture was about luxury goods. Which you're like, let's just, all right, let's just, let's just bring this. Let's just bring it, let's just, let's just vote. Because the people on Twitter were the ones to um, to vote, but you, Bacha, you are gonna decide this one. All right, all right. So the poll is gonna run for two minutes, starting now. Do we make a stream on Safabi luxury goods? That will have to be for April for next month. Do you want to see the other part of the lecture? Just gonna take a sip of tea as you answer. I bet those two were Typhoon and Bidivis. <laughs> oh, three now. If you want to see it, you want to see it more, the stuff of it.
All right. All right, four people went towards it. Highly, mm, there's no opposition. A little bit more. I still have the Wellerman playing here because I remember the last time we asked, uh, I asked anything about you, which uh, was about uh, music, and I ask about the Wellerman. So it comes whenever I run a poll, it comes into my mind. I'm really sorry. So finally, we're gonna have it. Any more people that would like to vote? The motion is approved. Caso cerrado. Do you know that? Do you know that? Do you know Caso Cerrado? <laughs> Please let me know you do. I would be such a big fan of yours if you did. The people have spoken, and I from the Talar on my Chehel Sotun, no such Chehel Sotun, I'm gonna start again. I, as the Shah of these, am I the Shah? As the plumas of this Twitch channel, <laughs> Doctora Maria Polo. <laughs> As the plumas of this channel from my talar, from my Porsche in my beautiful Alicabu Pavilion, you asked, I shall deliver. All right, next month we're going to see stuff a bit looser good. All right, just because you liked it. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for taking place. Thank you so much for participating. And Butcher, this is all for us. This is us for the Monday. I'm really happy you enjoyed the ride. I really liked uh, the tour too, myself. And uh, I'm going to tell you something. My student... My students really, really liked <laughs> stream on Callar Fauna pa' cuando? Los leones pa' cuando? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never if I can avoid it. Um, if I can prevent that from happening. Jesus Christ, no. So, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for everyone out. I was going to tell you, my students really enjoyed it too. Some of them wrote uh, emails to me saying that they really uh, liked the style of my lectures. And I was just laughing. Was, I'm, I'm much more serious when I teach. <laughs> But not quite, not so much. And if you're curious, yes, I teach with this one too. This one features on my on my lectures too. Of course, I mean the sound quality is just so good. And um, they, one of them, uh, they sent me a very beautiful message saying how my enthusiasm had helped them going through a little bit of a hard time and just to dive into the wonders of Safavid Iran. And um, you know what? That is one of the reasons I'm here. I that one just because of that one comment. My day is entirely made. This is the reason we teach. And uh, I'm, I'm aware, I acknowledge that this is not being an easy time for any of us. And we need to take care of our students. At least that is something I do firmly believe. So, but ciao. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for everyone who's followed the channel. Thank you for your subscriptions, the peeps who are subscribed. Thank you so much as well to my patrons. If you would like to support the project on Patreon, just look for it. Patreon slash Las Plumas de Simur. Extra content behind the scenes, exclusive patron content, and much more. We have fun. We have fun. Actually, we um. I always say this, but we do. We do have fun on on Patreon. I love my patron family. Thank you, because if if it went for you, I couldn't be here. And um, yeah. If you liked, thank you so much, Aaron, my secretary, coming to the call as always. Uh, if you would like to see more of these streams, streams happen on Mon in English happen on Monday. We talk about something, about a topic, and on Saturday at 3 p.m. UK time, that is uh, GMT, uh, we have tea. We have tea. We talk about a lot of things. The other day, we listen to music, we watch videos, we um, are going to start playing video games because I am building my <laughs> streaming video game empire. We're definitely not going to play something this Saturday. I'm not going to say what. I did say what on Saturday, though. It doesn't matter, I'm not gonna repeat it. <laughs> but in case you wanna pop by, thank you so much for being here. I introduced myself before, I'm gonna do that again. My name is Plumas and I am your host here. Thank you for joining me in this wonderful Safabit adventure. I hope you like the ride and I hope to see you again soon. I hope to see you again soon. And yeah, if you wanna catch uh, more in any in any other circumstances, you can follow the social media of the project. There's Twitter, there is Instagram, and and there's Twitch. <laughs> That's basically it. But it's been an enormous pleasure for me. And as I always say to you, don't forget to explore, to create, and to have an enormous amount of fun. I shall see you very soon and but ciao again my pleasure is always a pleasure. Call out this!